All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session of Vital Voices on Shopping Under Suspicion. My name is Stephen Volano, and I am the director of the Center for Public Service and Community Research. And I wanna welcome those of you who are here in the room and enjoying some pizza, as well as those of you who are online and couldn't able, weren't able to join us here in person. Uh, but before we get started, I wanna brag a little bit about UHD. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but UHD was recently voted by the Wall Street Journal, not voted, ranked by the Wall Street Journal to be among the top 400 uh, uni colleges in the United States. Specifically, we were recognized as being number one for diversity and number three for student experience. It's pretty good. Um, there's a lot of good stuff happening here at UHD, uh, especially right here in the College of Public Service. So we, for instance, our Masters of Science in Criminal Justice program has been recognized as one of the best online programs um, in the country by US News and World Report, and that's the sixth year in a row that we've gotten that distinction. Um, we believe that a, co a career in public service, whether it's urban education, social work, or criminal justice, is, is a calling pursued by individuals really wanting to serve or passionate about serving the well-being of our community. Um, so, as you may know, uh, Vital Voices is a forum to bring uh, speakers, practitioners, experts in the field to UHD to speak about issues that are very important to the public, to our public lives. We have, over the years, explored a variety of subjects uh, relevant to our community, such as addiction, youth in the criminal justice system, uh, homelessness, re reducing recidivism, the graying of America, immigration, um, school violence, childhood grief and trauma, bail reform, cognitive dissonance, voting justice, and even modern day slavery. So um, in the next two weeks, we're gonna conduct two additional sessions. One is a discussion with the 2002 Texas Poet Laureate, Lupe Mendez, uh, and he's gonna discuss the use of poetry as a means of communication across all platforms and across, across all disciplines. And then that's gonna be followed by a robust panel discussion on the state of education here in Texas. Um, that's going to be uh, that's going to be quite a panel. We're going to have educators, administrators, parents, and students. And I warn you, there could be very there could be fireworks at that session. So, um, but you, you really may it should be a very interesting session. So, in November, we're going to host a two part series on AI. The first one is is entitled AI Demystified: The Use of Everyday of AI in Everyday Life. And the second is going to be titled Bridging Technology and Compassion, the Impact of AI in Education and Social Services. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Sean, although you said your name different than I would say Gabadon. it. Gabadon. Okay, so Dr. Sean Gabadon, who PhD, he's a distinguished professor of criminal justice at Penn State in Harrisburg. This semester, he's a visiting distinguished professor at Sam Houston State University, and he will be a Fulbright scholar, uh, Fulbright distinguished scholar at the University of Birmingham in the UK in this coming spring 2025. Professor Gabadon has served as a fellow at Harvard University's W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African American Research and has taught at the Center for Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of more than 75 peer-reviewed articles and 13 books, including Criminological Perspectives on Race and Crime, and the co-authored works A Theory of African American Offending Perspectives, African American Offending, and Shopping While Black, Consumer Racial Profiling in America. Professor Gabadon is a fellow of both the American Society of Criminology and the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. In 2024, he was the recipient of the Faculty Scholar Medal for the Social Sciences, which is the highest award for scholarship at Penn State University. His research interests include race and crime, public opinion on race, crime and justice, security administration, criminology, and criminal justice pedagogy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Gabadon. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, 
What I try to do typically is if I'm in a particular area, I'll just say, I'll contact someone and say, hey, I'm in the area. I've been doing some work on this particular topic. And, um, you know, would you be interested in me coming to give a talk on that topic? Uh, sometimes, obviously, I get invitations, but, you know, I'm not like some of the scholars out there. They just wait for those invitations. They're sitting at their desk waiting for invitations. Sometimes I just invite myself, okay, um, because I have a passion about this topic. And when you have a passion about a topic, you will do what you need to to get the information out, okay? Um, this particular topic, um, I've been studying it for about 20-plus years now. Uh, and what this presentation does is it kind of gives you um, – a timeline and some background and, and the struggles to kind of get uh, research done in this area. Um, obviously, uh, I was able to get some research done, but it wasn't easy, okay? Uh, so the first thing when I do this presentation is I kind of try and get people thinking about not the public justice system, the private justice system. One of the things is criminal justice majors, and, and many years ago there was more emphasis on uh, private security courses, things like that, but that's totally disappeared in, in favor of homeland security for obvious reasons. And because of that, people have forgotten that there's this whole justice system that operates on a whole different set of rules. When you go into a private establishment, that is not a public entity. And like um, when you think about criminal justice, criminal justice officials are what we call agents of the state. They are guided by the Constitution. In the private sector, they are not agents of the state. So they have a lot more latitude what they can do. They don't have to Miranda. You don't have to do all those things because they don't fall under that particular guideline. So think of it like that. Um, OK, typically private companies um, employ their own uh, in-house security. We call those proprietary security. And then other companies um, also give us um, things what we call contractual security, right? So you'll see Wells Fargo, things like that. If you need security services, they'll do that. Sometimes retailers do that, but most of the time they have their own in-house security. One thing, again, we don't think about is how big this entity is, OK? Because we talk about the police, but as you'll see here, um, in 2023, there were 925,000 uh, private security officers, according to the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics, and they outnumber police, public police, by about 200 and something thousand um, workers. Um, very few people actually care about what happens in this private justice system. And, you know, sometimes I, I do call when I when I contact people, like giving a talk, they're like, "What exactly will you be talking about? You know, if it doesn't have to do with policing, I mean, what 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 is it? You kind of have to explain to them." Um, what you're talking about. And that's okay, because most people just, when we think about um, enforcement, we think about public police, and that's, that's okay. But there's something else out there. And most people wouldn't care, but I wouldn't care either, except I worked in the field for five years before I got into um, academe. And, and even when I was in the field over 30 years ago, there were allegations of these type of things. When I got into the field, I was like, okay, well maybe, when I got into academia, I said, well maybe that's something I should study because nobody else seems to care about it. And for a while there, I tried to pursue it and I just didn't have any luck getting any funding. So it was, it was hard to do some of the things I wanted to do. But we'll talk about that. Uh, the United States is not unique. This particular um, figure shows us that when you look at other countries, they also rely heavily on this force. And most people don't even want, know what they do? Do they have complaints of brutality? Do they pro, I mean, because they're usually just focusing on the public. Uh, but this gives you an idea that, you know, again, uh, there's a lot of these, these entities out there across the globe. Okay, opening thoughts. View, very few scholars are interested in shoplifting, first of all, because that's what we're really talking about. That's what these entities are trying to do. They're trying to prevent shoplifting and also employee theft. Uh, I did a simple Google Scholar search for those of you students out there that use Google Scholar. And for shoplifting, I got about 70,000 hits, okay, when I put in shoplifting. When I put in homicide, okay, just as an example, uh, you got, uh, you know, so many more, right? Because that's what people are actually researching. Homicide and police, if I put in policing, it's, you know, it, it's just the, the, the database might just break, okay? But very few people are looking at this topic. Uh, criminologists and profiling experts know very little about it, and um, essentially one of my professional goals is to change this, just to give people another angle, also to open up the research in the area. Um, and maybe some of you will, as I go through this, will remember some of these high-profile cases 
where if you knew what was going on behind the scenes, uh, you'd be a lot more interested in it as well. Uh, OK, so here's an outline of the presentation. Some of this material will come from um, the book Shopping While Black, which sort of also chronicles some of the work that I've done. Um, and also, one of the things I've done in my career is I've taken on understudied topics. When I got into the field, I didn't get into the field to like follow the pack. You know, you get everybody's like, this is what you got to do to do whatever. I kind of went, that's the way the pack's going. I'm going that way, or I'm going out the opposite direction. So that what's makes, that's kind of what makes what I do kind of challenging. Um, then I also talk about a brief discussion about an experience I actually had working for a retailer looking at this question. Okay, and that's why I put shh there because you can't really talk about it because I'm under one of those NDAs, you know, you can't, you can't really talk about all the details, but I give you enough to get a sense of, of what goes on behind the scenes. Okay, so if you want to find out about shoplifting, there are several sources of data, okay? Um, you can go to something called the National Retail Security Survey. Um, it involves 107 77 retail brands of the major retailers out there, and they kind of report their losses and what's creating those losses. Because again, there is a problem here, it's just how we're addressing that problem in these particular settings. Uh, so what you see here is a large percentage of it, of the losses relate to shoplifting, also organized retail crime, which is a huge thing. Now, I don't know if you follow the news, but this is really big. Uh, some retailers are closing stores in particular areas because they just can't deal with these organized um, crime rings. Okay, the, the FBI Uniform Crime Reports, uh, this is a document that gives us sort of the number of um, arrests out there for shoplifting in uh, 2019. And the, the, the data has changed a little bit, but it's pretty much the same, right about 900,000 shoplifting arrests. Uh, now, the National Incident-Based Reporting System is a system that gives us more detail. The Uniform Crime Reports just tells us how many counts. It doesn't break it down by race and ethnicity. National Incident-Based Reporting System in 2022 gave us the actual number in terms of the percentage of who's arrested for shoplifting. So this gives you some sense of the actual demographics of who uh, commits this offense. OK, in addition to that, when you're doing a topic, you got to say, well, what's, what, what actual research has been done besides just looking at the numbers? And I just go through quickly some of these things. One study that was done um, uh, several years ago looked at um, what were the actual numbers in terms of race, ethnicity, and shoplifting? This was an, uh, an experimental study where people went, in, went into a store, the research went to a store, the store allowed them to put cameras in the store, all over the store, and they actually watched people shoplift and actually did a tally. And what they found was about 8.5% of shoppers engaged in shoplifting, and black and Hispanic shoplifters were not more likely to offend than whites. Okay, and this was in a very diverse area. It's a very um, good study published in one of the top journals in our field. Uh, also, another study where they had 40,000 people, they asked them about their uh, experience shoplifting, and about 11% um, of the respondents had a you know, lifetime likelihood of shop shoplifting. And then the Gallup poll, you know, most people know Gallup poll, one of the best polling uh, services out there. They ask this question pretty frequently, um, how people are treated in sto shore stores and shopping malls. And this gives you a sense of the numbers in terms of what people are actually feeling out there, okay, in terms of... Um, how they feel they're treated. And as you can see, there are differences by race and ethnicity there, OK? Uh, OK, so what is shopping while black? Um, that's the kind of the term people tend to use because they don't really get into all of the other groups, typically. What I've tried to do, and I'm beginning to do more, is expand out some of this. Because when I've done my uh, look at actual cases, it's not just black people being profiled in the retail settings, other groups as well. Uh, but there's this term, and consumer racial profiling. When you're in academia, we come up with these terms because they sound better than you know, other terms. So we came up with consumer racial profiling. Uh, and it's the act of discriminating against customers by retailers based upon their race and, uh, or ethnicity. Um, there's actually two types, OK? Um, prior to myself and a few business scholars getting into doing uh, this type of research, there was a whole heap of studies done on the lack of service uh, out there in terms of do racial ethnic groups get inferior service when they go into retail settings. Um, and for whatever reason, reviewers send me all of those papers from the, the journals thinking that I'm an expert in that. So I, in a way, I've become an expert because I'm reading a lot of those papers. But what I'm more interested in is the second half of this, which is the literature is very sparse, is you know, racial ethnic profiling as it relates to being suspected as thieves in retail settings. 
Um, so the question when I started out with this, you know, was is this practice new? Where did this behavior originate? Okay. The first thing I came up to was this thing called the black thief stereotype. Okay. And this stereotype was produced during the slave era. Okay. Uh, during the slave period, what we see is um, legislation that's passed. Because really, if you're not really there, we, we rely on records. And sometimes the best records I've found when I'm looking at things related to race and crime is to go to court cases. Because yes, you can find court cases from the 1600s which tell you exactly how justice was distributed back in those times. Um, but you can also look at le uh, legislation. One of the things we try and do, we talk about today is legislation that we would call is race neutral. Like we just, it's just legislation. Is not, well, legislation has always been racialized if we really look at how legis what, le what dictates a lot of legislation, especially related to criminal justice. But when you go back and you look at some of the statutes related to thievery, you see that racial element to them. Um, additional offenses, I mean, that, that's one statute, additional offen offenses of thieving call for branding, splitting of nose, and even execution. So back then, you know, this is, this is what was out there. If you were a black slave, that was what the penalties were in the 1700s for this. So it led to this perception that this group is more criminal, more thieve, you know, involved in thieving than other groups. Uh, in 1722, though, South Carolina lowered the penalties and acknowledged the obvious. And what was the obvious? That slaves were stealing out of necessity. They were being deprived. I mean, how else were they going to survive with the, the sustenance they had? Um, and also, I always talk about this. People, if you've taken a history class, you've heard about the Fugitive Slave Acts. And these were acts that were passed to try and ensure that if slaves escaped, that they were brought back. But that's nothing more than the idea that if you leave the slave system, you're stealing something. What are you actually stealing? Yourself. You're stealing property, right? It's like you don't understand. Like you have to really get into this in a deep manner to understand what these acts are really about. But it's also tied to this notion of the black thief, thief stereotype. OK. And if you look through this, some of this, sometimes I talk more about this, I'm going to talk less about this. If you look at some of the stuff related, some of Thomas Jefferson's stuff, Frederick Douglass' stuff, they talk about this idea of theft, this notion of theft as it relates to slaves. Um, very interesting stuff. OK, so uh, the other question is, what about Latinos, right? You know, what about other groups in, you know, and their history? Well, you have to brace yourself, because I'm sure maybe some of you have seen this before, but the criminal immigrant stereotype, too, has existed for a long time, right? This is a picture of a, a sign that was uh, presented in Dallas, Texas, by the Lone Star Restaurant Association. That's what they felt about this group. So you can imagine going, you know, even if you're able to get into a store with the kind of treatment you're going to get in terms of not just getting no treatment, but the uh, notion that, you know, you perceived a certain way, okay? And this is in the 19... I think that association started in the 1930s. It has a different name now. I was kind of looking it up. It has a different name now. But just think about a part of that is this whole criminal immigrant stereotype. And in certain settings, they're also criminalized as well. OK? OK. Uh, the black thief stereotype, the criminal immigrant stereotype, continued following the slave era. Um, blacks were viewed and, and others were viewed as thieves in stores located in northern cities. They couldn't even enter some stores. Sometimes I go to give talks and I, you know, I'll get the hands going. As soon as I say these things, hands will go up with some of the elderly people in there. They'll be like, yeah, I couldn't go in. I couldn't try and close. I couldn't. I mean, they're kind of remembering the treatment they got um, uh, when they were in, in these stores. Uh, and again, yes, they couldn't go in fitting rooms and white owned businesses, all these type of things. Again, connected to this whole um, racialization, um, inferiority, all of these things uh, tied up into this, this question. Uh, in the 1960s, this book comes out, and this is one of the first scholars who kind of looks at this question. And she examines seven years of shoplifting data in Chicago retail retailer, court data, police arrest data, um, and checked on the backgrounds of shoplifters. Because the idea is generally, well, what's the demographics of who we're arresting? And do those demographics in any way reflect reality? Okay, um, And she did a great job. Uh, she discusses the actual racist observations and arrest patterns in these stores. Uh, and again, the 1960s, just think about, you know, that's, that's a, good, a good while ago. What's that, 60 years? You know, um, so somebody was doing it back then, but nobody picked up on it 
to myself and some other scholars did. Uh, have we progressed since the mid 20th century? History is nice. People are like, okay, that's good. Can we can move on? Have you ever heard of the incidents involving Dillard's? I always tell people Dillard's in the height of those, in the, the height of the 90s was is equivalent to what I would say the New York City Police Department at the height of their uh, criminal activities as a police force. I mean, it was pretty bad. And you can read through the cases and all the stuff that, that went on there. Uh, Eddie Bauer, Cracker Bell, all of these stores have been engaged in this type of activities. And there are records, there are cases, there are suits that you know, sort of bear out the activities that they've done. Um, right in recently, um, they got in some trouble in the Wall Street Journal contacted me about it. They have some AI facial recognition software. I don't know if you all heard about this big article, uh, big case, but they had complaints from 2012 to 2020. So for about eight years, they mostly deployed this facial recognition, recognition on black, in black, Latino, uh, and Asian communities. They falsely accused customers of crimes, unfairly targeted uh, people of color, and guess what happened to them? The FTC banned the use of that technology for five years. That's how serious it was, OK? And the thing is, it's not like these, this is like what ha when we have like a, a police killing of a minority or something like that, where it is like huge news. And but this is the type of stuff that impacts upon your daily life when you go into these type of settings. So, Dr. Gabadon, what? So tell me, explain what the AI would do and who would, so it would, it, they would put it in the store and everyone would have their facial recognition? Um, they would have, they would be mostly deployed against these particular individuals to see if, you know, they were somebody who had been engaged in any type of activities that they were looking for. Um, so instead of just letting the technology sort of randomly do what it needs to do, it was kind of more targeted. They would take a picture of your face and run it against a database? Yes, right? yes, that's the kind of stuff they were doing. So the FTC was like, hold up, OK? Um, so what about the scholarly literature? Again, I'm just going to go through this quickly before I talk about some of the projects. Uh, when I started out, I had no, I, no real sense. I mean, I worked in the field. I used to get calls. I, I didn't really have a sense of it. So I went to the cases. And the cases started in the 70s, and it involved all, you know, all races and ethnicities in terms of people alleging that they were you know, unfairly targeted for suspicion in these settings. And the one thing that was consistent in all those cases is that they lost, okay? They did not win those cases, all right? And I'll talk about that. Um, and most litigants lose for a reason. And a professor at Illinois did an article recently, a little controversial. Um, but the base, essentially, the article says, it is legal to follow and watch people in retail stores based on their race, give inferior service to restaurant customers based on their race, and place patrons in certain hotel rooms because of their race. And she says that because if you look at the way the laws are structured, the real issue is if you do all of that stuff and you deny them the ability to make a purchase, that's where the real, uh, the real issue is when you look at sort of the way the law is structured. Obviously, um, if the, the behavior is excessively egregious, the courts will make some concessions. But uh, her, her assessment of that, of the, the laws out there and the statutes that apply to this is that, which is really interesting. Then people have done public opinion polls, so have I. There's been limited what we would call experimental studies. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, but I was interested many, many years ago, and again, I'm going to go through my, this older study a little quickly, um, interested in investigating the nature and extent of the problem. Because to me, you can't go on conventional wisdom. People are like, yeah, I know it's happening. Do you really? Do, have you talked to anybody? Do you, you, know, you know, you may have anecdotal stuff, but do you have any larger data? And that's what, what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do. So there were limited opportunities for funding. So, about 10, 15 years ago, um, I got a little bit of money, and that really got me going. And I decided to do what I would consider a victimization study. That study um, is the one that really kind of allowed me to move ahead, because you know, uh, the field started saying, OK, maybe there's something in. So what contextualizes this behavior? You know, When we talk about it, and we're thinking about for the, the students in here, you know, theory and things like that. I already talked about the black thief stereotype, the criminal immigrant stereotype. That is a way of sort of contextualizing what we see when this plays out. Um, the racialization of crime, 
Jeanette Covington talks about it. Other scholars have talked about that. We have this thing where we have a particular crime, we attach a race to it. So if we talk about white collar crime, people automatically think, oh, it's a white person. We, we think about homicide, we think black people. You know, If we think about whatever crime it is, we, we are, there's this, this thing that we have, we attach to it and we racialize it. When in fact, the reality is if you go to any um, full record of all the crimes in the United States, UCR and IBRS, every group commits every crime. It's just it may vary in terms of how much they commit that crime. Um, so when we racialize it, it doesn't really do justice to really what's going on in, in the, the country. And, and what Catherine Russell Brown talks about this notion of the criminal black, criminal black man, which again is sort of like the stereotypical stuff. So that's the way you can kind of think of these things. Um, another way to think of these things is like a cycle. And this is in my book, it's the Shopping One Black Cycle, but you can do it for other, my, other groups as well. Just think of it like this. This is what actually happens. Blacks or other minorities into a retail establishment, okay? Blacks are observed for suspicion of theft more than other racial ethnic groups. So that's, let's just say, so they come, blacks come in there or other minority groups come in there and that's all you're following, okay? Um, more so than other groups. So they're disproportionately arrested because let's be honest, if you watch uh, only one type of, we'll just, use another one type of speed. If you're only watching black people on the highway, are you going to go catch some black speeders? Yeah. If you only watch white people, are you going to catch what? Yes. Yeah, so it's not unusual for you going to, that you're going to find what you're looking for in some cases because you're over, uh, you're, you're, you're over um, surveilling them, so you're going to do that. And what happens is you have shoplifting statistics reflecting that and then all of a sudden, you're like, it, the cycle starts over again. You have more of them being arrested. So, oh, well, that's who I'm going to follow. But it's because of the approach that you took in the uh, beginning that creates this, this cycle. OK, so developing an understudy topic. For me, I needed to you know, I use newspaper articles to kind of give me an idea what I should do in the study, um, and also use the legal cases sort of as a framework. So I had money to do one little study in Philadelphia. Uh, I used Philly because it was a, a diverse area. Um, and these are the questions I kind of asked. Um, have citizens experienced this? And it was their perceptions of experiencing it. Uh, if so, to what extent? What was the nature of these incidents? Uh, what is the response to experiencing it? What were the emotions surrounding it? I think that's the, to me in our field, there's, that's the understudied aspect of being profiled. Not enough people look at how does this actually impact upon people emotionally uh, and, and physically, um, and what should they be done doing this? Um, it was a, I'll just skip through that. It was basically a phone survey, 40% response rate in Philadelphia. I, at Penn State Harrisburg, people always ask me why did I stay there so long. They actually have a center for survey research, so they actually did the survey. Um, uh, but this is, uh, more importantly, the script that was used. The following questions ask you about consumer racial profiling, which we refer to as uh, CRP. CRP is defined as the act of discriminating against customers by retailers based on their race or ethnicity. It's specifically concerned with, we wanted to make sure they understood what we were talking about, being racially profiled by store clerks, managers, and security personnel, which separates us from what typically people are looking in terms of just general service. And I also put in here, all races and ethnicities can experience this type of discrimination. Again, some people get, you know, they have the philosophy that, you know, whites can't be profiled, things like that. I don't believe that. I mean, I've done studies looking at um, racial profiling and in, in, in other aspects. And I've had white people going into projects or developments, going to visit their black friends, and their profile as drug buyers and things like that. So we have, there are these dynamics that happen where, where whites are profiled as well. So. I made sure to include that. So what did we find um, in terms of this? These are just quick things, and we have um, uh, other things that I'll talk about. But 43% of the respondents reported experience in it. 64% of blacks, 21% of whites, and the other groups we didn't have like enough to really say a whole bunch about. Um, most indicated they occasionally experienced it, 64%. 26% said almost all the time they felt like they were being surveilled in this particular setting. 52% uh, experienced it in an urban area, given that it was, you know, Philly area. Uh, that makes sense. 40 in a suburban area. So this is people who live in the suburbs or going out to the suburbs uh, where they have, in some cases, the nicer malls. 
um, uh, especially King of Prussia, if you know anything about Philly, that's a huge mall out there. Uh, they identified department stores, clothing retailers, and grocery stores were identified as places where most of the incidents occurred. Interestingly, again, like, this is another one where people are always like, hmm, 58% of profiles were white, 25% black, 11% Asian, and 5% Hispanic. This one's interesting because most people would, the way we think of race relations in America, a lot of times we just think, okay, it's a black-white thing, you know? But in essence, if we think about how uh, things are presented in a more, and generally in society, uh, black people, Asian people, Hispanic people, white, we're all exposed to the same things that perpetuate the same stereotypes. So, it's a matter of us also internalizing this, whether you're black or you know, Hispanic or Asian, a lot of times we'll internalize the same things and that will uh, produce some of the same types of behaviors in terms of profiling. Uh, most situations of all sales associates, not security. And people are like, well, well why is that, Sean? Why? Well, because you know, as a former security manager, a lot of these situations will come from calls from the floor. Right, so when I worked in, in, the, in the, the field, you'd get a call, you know, watch this group, they're in Polo, or they're in Tommy Hilfiger's section, and they, they won't articulate, but when you put up the cameras up there, it's a group of minorities in there, and for some reason, their antenna go off that, you know, uh-oh, these people are gonna steal. Okay, uh, most of the incidents involved being watched, followed around throughout the store, which is uh, it's pretty typical. Okay. So this is the thing that, uh, this is the part with, that most, again, most people don't really think about, but what happens after the incident, right? So you, you go into the store, you've experienced this negative encounter, um, but most people don't report it. So they just go in, 80% of them said, they just go in and you know, after it's over, they're just like, oh, they just go about their business. About half still actually made a purchase in the store. So think about this, you followed around the store, people are shadowing you, and you still make that purchase. And I had some, one of the things for this question, I asked some qualitative questions. And essentially, people wanted to let the people following them know that they had the money to make the purchase. So it was their way of sort of fighting back, saying, I can make this purchase. Uh, many go back to the store again, about 40%. They get this bad treatment, but they go back. And the comments suggest that some of them felt like they had limited um, options in terms of where they purchase their goods. So that's why they went back. Uh, most people reported actually their family and friends. They talked to their family and friends. I went in there, you know, this situation happened, they talk about it, and most of their family and friends also indicated that they had experienced it. But many of them didn't report it either. And the top four reasons were not a big deal. And that means to some extent They've, they've internalized it, uh, normalized this type of behavior, right? So you go in, you follow them, oh, they're just following me, it's not a big deal, I just, go ahead. Um, some people just felt like, you know, I had stuff to do, I didn't want to stop. Um, some people just want, you know, at, upon reflection, they just weren't sure why they didn't do, why, why didn't they report it given the treatment that they received? And then some people are like, they're just not gonna believe it, so just, let's just, you know, just leave it alone. Uh, the emotional impact, we asked them how did it make them feel? 61% you know, said, agreed or strongly agreed that it was stressful. It made them angry. They were shocked that it happened to them. They were saddened by it, embarrassed by it. Um, and a lot of people said it just had a negative impact, that whole encounter. But think about these emotional, the emotional impacts of it but yet still going through with sales, having to go back to that same place where that situation occurred. Um, very interesting dynamics there. We did some multivariate analysis, meaning that we kind of looked at how all these things went together, what factors influenced the likelihood of having experienced it. Blacks were nine times more likely than whites to report experiencing it. More educated people were more likely to report, report experiencing it. Uh, males were more likely than females to report experiencing it. And Income wasn't significant. And I think, you know, I'm teaching at Sam Houston now, and you know, some people, we're doing some projects, and they're like, oh, it's not significant. We're not gonna get it published, whatever. I'm like, I have to tell them, hold on. Just because it's not significant doesn't mean it's insignificant, right? 
It is sometimes non-significant findings are significant, right? So income means that it doesn't matter how much money you have. You know, uh, one of the things people have said when I've interviewed them is says, well, sometimes, you know, to avoid that, I'll dress in a suit or I'll dress up to, you know, to kind of deter them. That doesn't work. According to this, the income really doesn't matter when you're talking about um, being profiled in these settings. What uh, factors influence the likelihood of reporting it? They're more likely to report it, actually, if they have these negative emotions that I just had on the other slide. Um, also, they're more likely to report it if the profiler was actually white, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they're less likely to report if the person resides in an urban area. So maybe people from urban areas are just more likely to engage these things, and they just say, we're not reporting it. Okay. Um, so again, an early kind of look at this, um, but there's been more recent research on this particular topic, and not all of it by me, so you know you have to put that out there. Um, in 2020, uh, there was a racial bias study done that was commissioned by Sephora, okay? And uh, Cassie Pittman Claytor and David Crockett did this massive study that was funded by Sephora, where they had you know 58. Um, shoppers and 14 employees they interviewed, thousands of U.S. shoppers and retail employees were, in, were included in their study. And they found that three in five retail shoppers have experienced discriminatory treatment. Again, think about my study from years ago. What I started seeing was that things hadn't changed a lot. You know, theirs were more, their study was more national in, in a sense. Two in five retailers, um, shoppers of personal experience unfair treatment based on the basis of their race and skin color. As you can see, whites less so than Asians, Asians less so than Latinx, Latinx and then blacks, 53% at the top. And that's, again, it bears out that earlier research I did. You know, I didn't have the, you know, probably tens of thousands of dollars they did, but it kind of holds it. This stuff is still something that we should be looking at and trying to do something about. Uh, three in five retail employees have witnessed bias at their workplace. And one in three retail employees have contemplated quitting when they experience racial bias and unfair treatment. 31% uh, for all employees and 37% for um, black employees. So what you see here is sort of a continuing a sort of a confirmation of some of the earlier findings. Uh, and they also had, had, did this. It says, most US shoppers feel judged by these things based upon their studies, which I found very interesting they put this back to put this together in terms of a, a table. Uh, different kinds of things uh, that typically you don't think about, but you know, this is what they, this is how shoppers feel when they go into these type of settings. In addition to some of the stuff that we're looking at, these are the other things. Uh, this is again another interesting part of their study, and I found similar things in terms of coping mechanisms. How do you deal with these ty this type of treatment in these settings? Today, we can just shop online, right? We're just like, I'm not dealing with it. Just go to Amazon, right? Um, that's interesting because at the, at the turn of the 20th century, most blacks and others who couldn't enter these stores used catalog shopping. That's how they got their goods. Because the treatment was so bad and, and certain places, they just couldn't go, all right? So are we ret going to return to that is the, is the question, right? Something like that. They don't try samples. They don't do things where they feel like they're going to be observed um, unduly. Uh, they adjust their body languages. Some people, you know, it's almost like uh, years ago there was a study that came out and they talked about this stuff. And people said, well, how do you deal with it? You know, how do you, you know, and it was a study of black males. And it was saying, how do you deal with this idea that, you know, you're, um, people are scared of you or there's, there's this notion of suspicion? And they said they smile a lot. That's how they cope with it. <laughs> that's how they, that's their kind of coping mechanism to disarm people who see them one way, uh, which was kind of an interesting article. They dress nicely, as I said before, but as you can see from my research from early on, that doesn't necessarily serve as a protective factor from being profiled. Some people actually say they make a shopping plan. So they just have minimal employee interactions, so they don't have to deal with it. Uh, and I can understand that, because some of the cases that I've looked at over the years, there's a case where a woman, you could tell, 
she experienced this black woman experienced this over and over again. And this clerk wouldn't stop following her and she pushed the clerk and it turned into this whole thing. But that wasn't just because of that clerk. It just wasn't because of that one sales associate. It was because of the continuing treat mistreatment she was getting in stores. Um, and you see these type of things as you kind of read through the cases. Because not all of the cases make the news, right? There's so many cases that happen that you, know, you never hear about. Um, because again, they're just not as, they're as, as uh, pertinent in terms of how we see these type of things. Um, they interact with employees, they show their interest in the spending, so they, you almost adjust your behavior to make other people feel comfortable enough not to follow you around, which is pretty potent if you think about that, okay? Okay, now here's the bonus material, I gotta go. I can go up to the line, but I can't go over that line because I don't want people running after me saying, Sean, you violated that NDA, okay? All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little story you know, and tell you the research as well, okay? I got an interesting call several years ago from a major law firm. That law firm is called Jones Day. It's like a major international law firm. Anybody going into law, you know, you looked at him, oh, he, he was Jones Day, it's a pretty big one. The lawyer from this firm called my office at Penn State Harrisburg. I picked up the phone and they said, you know what, Sean? Um, they wanted to know if I had an opportunity to meet with them about a potential consulting opportunity. And I'd done consulting before with um, attorneys on cases you know, related to this stuff. And I was like, okay, you know. So they bought me a train ticket and put me on a ride from Harrisburg to New York City. Uh, they told me the destination I was going. They didn't tell me the name of the company. They didn't tell me anything other than be here, you know. And I went and I had a very interesting meeting uh, of vice presidents, higher ups in this company about the problem they were having and the concern they had because guess what? It was killing their business, okay? This particular instance, because they were, being, they were perceived as a major offender of profiling. You know, uh, and there were protests and everything going on at the time. It was pretty crazy, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm going to try and help. Okay, I'm going to try and help. Uh, so two weeks after the meeting, because in that meeting, you know, they had my article. They had my articles. I had one person, you know, re they read a passage of an article. So you say this in your article. What do you mean by that? And the passage was, I said, well, if these retailers don't get it together, I think boycotts are an effective way to deal with this, right? They're like, do you really mean that? I was like, yes, I really mean it. I have three African-American boys. If they're going, they can't go in the store and they're getting profiled, I'm going to say let's boycott the place, OK? And he just looked at me and was like, OK. And two weeks later, they still hired me. So I don't know, maybe somebody else in the room said, you know, don't worry about it. You know. Uh, but yes, okay, so I was hired, but I had to do this non-disclosure thing, which, you know, is kind of interesting because we always talk about non-disclosures now in a, in a sort of popular culture about this, the stuff that's going on, obviously. Uh, but anyway, I needed help, so I asked somebody uh, from uh, university, at the time he was at University of South Florida, but O.J. Mitchell, he's currently at University of Cal Irvine. Um, he's an experimental, what do we call it, experimental criminologist. And I knew when they tell, when I was in that board meeting just by myself with all the vice presidents, I was already thinking, like, they're gonna do almost anything to try and fix this problem, from what I gathered. So I'm like, I'm gonna do, I know I'm gonna have to do a multi prong, and it gives me an opportunity to do research that nobody else will fund, okay? So that multi pronged approach first involved, for me, interviewing executives throughout the country, the uh, company. So I called, I looked, I said, where's your chart of all the, all the higher ups? I want to talk to this person, that person. I wanted to see some of the institutional history surrounding this and where their mind frame or where, what they were really thinking um, about this topic. So I did that. I reviewed their 500 page uh, sales associate manual and their 500 page uh, loss prevention manual. Okay, and I went through every single page making, you know, uh, my comments and, you know, and, and my concerns. Then I had to determine this. I said, we, you know, obviously they had their um, shoplifting statistics. I had to kind of determine um, whether what was happening in terms of those disparities were just disparities 
or it was racial discrimination. And that's a tough thing. People don't, people sort of confound the two things, right? So we know that certain groups offend at different rates with different crimes, right? So not everybody offends at the same rate. So it's not that every time you see a disparity, it's actually discrimination occurring, right? That's tough for some people to comprehend because it's an emotional topic. If you see disparities, some people say, it's, they're discriminating, that's the first thing. But, but we took it from the approach that we have to first figure out a way to determine that, okay? Um, so, if we wanted to determine um, whether discrimination was going on, there's multiple ways to do this. There's three ways that we kind of approached it. The first is something called the population benchmark. So the retailer is kind of, you know, you have a retailer and you have to kind of figure out based upon the number of apprehensions, shoplifting apprehensions, do or are those numbers reflective of the general population that's dealing with that, that, that sort of shops in that store, okay? Or in that particular area as well, right? So um, if you have 40% Latino arrest, for example, is the population in that area 40%? But there's an inherent problem with that. And we told them that. And um, the inherent problem is that if you're dealing with a retailer that has international traffic, right, the benchmark that you're going to use is going to be off, right? How do you know? You got people coming from all over the world to this particular store. So using the local population benchmark to determine, OK, all right, there's more Latinos than should be based upon here is not good. So we had to come up with something else. We came up with something called the violator benchmark, right? The violator benchmark, and you kind of have to think about this, is it's this benchmark where you look at your apprehension statistics, right? Okay, so you have so many Latinos, so many Asians, so many blacks, okay, in your apprehension statistics, and you percentage it out. And then you get data, and what we got was New York City arrest data for shoplifting in the surrounding retailers around with one of the, ma the main stores that we were looking at to determine whether those numbers were reflective of the same numbers at the retailer we were studying. Because that at least tells us if in the retailer we're studying, 80% of the people who were being you know, arrested for shoplifting were Latino, and only 10% of the people in the other retailers around, surrounding were Latino, you might actually have a problem, right? But in the case where you have 40%, let's say, Latino in the, st the store we're studying, and 40% in all other stores, you may be like, well, it's probably just a disparity. But there's one problem with that. Anybody know what that one problem might be? If, everybody, if, if it's 40% Latino in all of the stores, even though Latinos will say are only 10% of the population in that particular area, what might be the problem if we got 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 all around? We told them that the problem with that is that all the stores could be profiling. Okay, <laughs> that could what be a problem. So what we were building to was like, population benchmark, okay. Violated benchmark, a little better. But we actually wanted to do an audit study, which is an experimental approach. So we were like, we can just do the population benchmark looking at the numbers, but we're gonna tell you that that's not gonna give you a, a clear sense of what's going on. We can do the violated benchmark, which we did, and I'll talk about the results of that. But what we need to do is actually have testers go into the store and, and, and do this, do, do it in an experimental way. All right, so, and I already talked about this part, the problems with the population benchmark. We'll skip through that. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, even with the population benchmark, sometimes if, if you know your, your demographics of the area are a certain number, and this happens with policing too, right? Let's say there's... 40% black people in there, and you know you arrested 50% blacks one month, you're like, okay, we gotta get those numbers down to make it in line. You, you, can, you can do that if you're using that particular benchmark. So there's ways to manipulate that. Um, that's kind of another one. And the retailing question had considerable issues with the population benchmark. There was, there was just the, the, um, the benchmark 
the demographics that we came up with for the particular retailer were totally out of line with the apprehension. So they did have that problem. And that allowed us to say, yes, there's something that we need to do more. And as I said, we used a violator benchmark to um, look at this. Um, see if there's anything else. OK, I talked about that. OK, so for this retail, I can just say this. I can't give you the numbers. I can't give you all the stories. I can't give you all that stuff, OK? 16 out of 30 stores, we had to exclude 12 stores because they just didn't have enough apprehensions to do what we needed to do. Uh, stores with racial ethnic minorities, largely black and Latinos, were disproportionately apprehended for petty shoplifting in comparison to petty shoplifting thefts in the surrounding areas. So 16 out of 30, OK? Uh, OK. So the audit methodology, let's go through this a little bit. Um, how am I doing on time? OK. The third method, as I said, was this. Um, audit studies and testers of different races, but well-matched and other relevant characteristics to sort of locations just to, um, to see what's actually going on. Because really, most of what we're able to do quickly are just perceptual studies of victimization. Do you feel like this happened? Do you think it happened? You know? I mean, that's not as good as actually seeing what happens. And that's what we, we tried to do here. Um, when we got to this point, we were like, we need money. And they said, OK, well, how much do you need? So we just said we would do a small study because um, they, they needed something done like within a time frame. And you know, we couldn't go on and on. But I'll talk about it. Um, other studies compare treatment of testers by race. If minority testers are treated less favorably, then this is evidence of racial discrimination. This provides more concrete, a more concrete way to determine discrimination than just using the other ones. OK. Uh, Let's see. So we did this in um, stores in Manhattan. And what we had to do was we, had to, we, we picked the high volume store for this particular retail. And what we had to do was they didn't want anybody to know that they were doing this study. So we had to pick other retailers and have our testers go into the other retailers as well and do the same thing to disguise who the actual retailer was. Okay. So we couldn't like say, oh, go to this one. They were like, oh, you know, before you, you know how students are. They're going to go out and tell anybody. This retailer had us doing, you know, they, they go out and tell everything. So we figured they would have any, no idea. They just thought we were doing a multi-retailer uh, study, which is not what we were actually doing. But, uh, do my own shoppers report less favorable in-store treatment than white shoppers? All race differences in shopper treatment attributable to markers of socioeconomic status. Um, those are all, that's all we could, they gave us some money, but they didn't give us the boatload of cash we were looking for, okay? So that's, we limited, we had limited. Uh, testers, closely matched and relevant features, but very young race ethnicity. We had 20 quartets, African Americans, Latino, Asian, Latino, and white, audited client store, and as I said, three decoy stores. They were matched on physical size, age, and obviously we, we couldn't do the full spectrum, so we did convenience and use college students, OK? Because uh, we had access to college students in Manhattan. Uh, and we matched them on gender. The most conspicuous difference among these that we had were skin color. What we did, we had to narrow it down. We couldn't do every floor, every shift, every. We couldn't do all of that. We just didn't have the, the resources, and we didn't have the time, really. Uh, so we ordered to select departments with high levels of racial, ethnic disparities and apprehensions in client store with the highest revenue store. So we had to pick one, and that's what we did. That's the way we did it. This is kind of the study. Uh, 20 test groups of four shoppers. It kind of gives you an idea. Test shop on two different days, one day in business clothes, one day in casual clothes. Um, six shopping episodes in each day, three episodes at the client store, three episodes at the decoy store. Um, Half episode were in what we call standard mode, which was basically regular shopping. And then we had them alter their behavior to see if that impacted upon if they were um, followed or not. And again, it was also, again, we had some limits there because we wanted to do some other stuff, but we just didn't, couldn't do it. And it was really at the end with this study, there was only one statistical finding. Uh, African Americans were most likely to be greeted, and Asians were least likely to be greeted by store personnel. No other difference in quality of service, wait times, and perceptions of being followed by uniform or plain clothes security. And that's important. Again, it's limited because what we really wanted to do, we didn't want their perception if they were followed. It'd be nice to have hired other people to, follow, to kind of look to see if they were following them, get access to cameras. There were a lot of things that we just couldn't do, but I'm hoping down the road we can do. Um, only gender difference was white males more likely than Asian males to be offered directions to their desks. Um, 
uh, designation or destination, I should say. Uh, caveats. It's crucial that retailers compare the apprehension patterns of individual security agents to identify individual agents apprehending unusually large proportions of minority. So while we looked overall, really you need to actually drill down a little more on that. Can I stop uh, you for a minute? Can you go back to another, your other sure. slide? Yeah. So the, the, uh, if I'm reading that correctly, the findings were not, there was nothing significant? There was nothing significant really, it, and, and especially related to what we were investigating. Um, but again, that could be a product of the fact that we, we didn't have the resources to do the ma more massive study, which is what really needs to happen, because you can, you can cover it more you know, in terms of the retailer, but we just couldn't. We had to kind of make some concessions, okay? But, but yeah, uh, but to us, it was better for us to at least do that, and we told the retailer, you know, what's gonna happen is, you know, Probably somewhere down the road, somebody's going to allege that you know you were that there's some kind of profiling happened, and maybe it did, but maybe it didn't. But at least you can say you did all you could to at least investigate this, you know, more systematically. And I think that's important. They actually went out and did it, and they pretty much did everything that I asked them to do, except post their apprehension statistics online. They didn't do that. They were like, no, we're not doing that. Okay, <laughs> they didn't want anybody to see their numbers. Uh, but anyway, uh, getting back to this, and the other thing too is people always say, okay, diversifying staff, you know, if you had more minority uh, souls associates, more minority security staff, in this case, we, are, we looked at that, the majority of the security staff were, were black and, and Latino, and the majority of the sales associate staff was black and Latino, so it's not just about that, okay, uh, which I think is important to, to note. Uh, every policy needs to be evaluated. Um, there were several things in terms of incentivizing, to, in my reading of their policies, as incentivizing bad behavior in terms of um, loss prevention. And I, and I gave them some suggestions for correcting that. And also just policies in terms of apprehension policies. But there was also one policy that was really, you know, like, you guys need to stop this, like, right away. Uh, there's a policy called civil recovery. Most people don't really know this. But retailers, when they catch you shoplifting, in some states they allow the retailer to actually find you in store. Okay, that means that you know, okay, you shoplifted, we can charge you like five hundred dollars. There's limits to it, but it's basically a fine for shoplifting. And I said to them, like you're being, you know, accused of profiling, so. Conceivably, you're over arresting, disproportionately arresting minorities, and then you're finding them on top of that. I was like, I think you have a real problem. You need to stop this policy like today. And they stopped the policy, but down the road, they still got sued because of that policy, okay? Um, but that's again something in the private sector, people know nothing about it, but they can do that in some states, they, um, they have that policy. Um, employee assessments will need to be uh, scrutinized, which uh, I did for them. Uh, and then I, I got the retailer to sponsor a conference on the topic. Um, and they had like an endowed speaker series. Just something, again, to make them sort of invest more in helping to try to solve this issue. And it was a great conference in New York City. Um, policy considerations, again, you know, these kind of things you need to read out, weed out sort of this type of discrimination, obviously. How policies, training, discipline action, and I would say screening. I don't think I have that on there. Yeah, it's screening is very important as well. Uh, some stores recently, you all probably heard about this, you know, Starbucks and all these other stores, they closed for a day, they had this training, sensitizing people to it. There's a big case in uh, Philadelphia and Carbon Starbucks. Uh, so it's, you know, again, it's dramatic. Uh, some people, some people have like evaluated these things and said they're not as effective as you think, but it does, you know, send a message that this is important. People need to take action. I say boycott, you know, if it gets to that point. But you know, at least black buying power alone is one eight point trillion dollars a year. So there's some power in those numbers. Uh, confront real shop online. Yeah, I mean, really, consumer racial profile needs to progress like you know the others. I mean, really, we we started honing in on on traffic stops because of litigation. You know, where people actually were required by the courts to track stops, like who, who's being stopped, and that's when they find out like the egregious nature of what was happening in terms of racial, ethnic minorities being over, um, 
overstopped or dis disproportionately being stopped on, on the highways. Uh, longitudinally, I'll skip through that. Yes, it'd be nice to do these things over time. Um, ethnographic studies, people have done studies where they've actually worked in retail departments and the stuff that they find is like, okay, really bad in some cases. Very little research done in employee investigations. Like, is that, are certain groups targeted in retailers, you know, for, you know, extra scrutiny when they employees there? Um, private companies apparently are the only ones that want to fund this research. I'm going to try and do something in terms of thinking about maybe applying for a foundation um, grant to do this, but most people are just, they just don't really connect it. Um, and this one is one I'm working on. I just collected some data from Canada. I used the same, uh, sort of the same survey with slight modifications in Canada, and we're finding the same things among, particularly among blacks, Latinos, and indigenous people in Canada, um, and, a, and, you know, and Asians too, that they're um, feeling like they experience this more than other groups as well. And they, in recent years, they've had some incidents related to this. Uh, my graduate class on race and crime, shout out to them if they're watching. Um, they're working with me and we got some papers that we're gonna be working on related to that data. So they're very happy that uh, I'm visiting this semester, they're getting papers, so. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we collected data in April and my, my class, we're working on some papers. But I'm actually going to the UK in the spring on a Fulbright and guess what I'll be doing? I'm gonna be doing that same survey to see what it's like in the UK. And the ultimate goal is actually to just build enough of research so when I go to a foundation, they're like, okay, it's time for us to do some kind of, what I wanna do is like a regional study uh, where we do experimental approaches and more um, expansive than that was done for that, um, that consultancy that I did. All right, we'll talk about that. Big picture, this isn't about shoplifting. It's one aspect of what people talk about, uh, theorists talk about is everyday racism. Everyday racism and negative emotions it evokes has been connected to eating disorders, elevated blood pressure, a host of other negative health outcomes that are tied to longevity. Um, if you look at the literature on racism and the physical impact on people, you know, just imagine you get in your car and theoretically, we'll just say in the worst case scenario, your profile there. Then you go to the store, your profile there. You go to, I mean, and if, even if you have a sense that this is going on, it impacts you in a physical way. And, and those articles, some of the articles that are done out there uh, from a public health standpoint that look at these, these connections are very fascinating. Okay, I've been talking and talking and talking. Um, if you have any questions, please, you know, I'm happy to answer. I'd be curious to know, has anyone in this room experienced racial profiling? So, so, so tell us about it. Uh, not great. I don't know how to express that. Okay. Anybody? How about you? My general thought is I felt unwelcome. Did you continue to buy in the store? Uh, I think only once or twice, but after that, I just stopped going. How about you over here, sir? Yeah, I, I literally just stopped uh, shopping at that store. Stop shopping at that store. Anyone else experience it? All right, and I do have a question online. Okay, great. What, somebody else? No, okay. Um, we have a question online that says, is this problem happening more in poor communities or all communities? And are you suspicious based upon your race and gender? I'm not quite sure what that means, but is the problem happening in more in poor communities? Um, it's a mix. Um, one of the things you also have to think about, sometimes when you're in a poor community, the businesses aren't as you know, expansive, so you go out of your community to get some of the things that you can't get in your community. And sometimes those communities don't necessarily look like you, right? You're going into a, you know, a white community or a you know, suburban community where they're not necessarily, in some cases, uh, places that are used to seeing many people, minorities out there. Also, sometimes it happens in suburban areas. I think less so in like local community stores, but some of, uh, I'll just say this, some of the interviews I've done occasionally to stay up on a topic, I'll do focus groups, I'll do different things to kind of see what's going on. One of the things that's been consistent, you'll see black women saying they go into hair stores and they profile like they're gonna steal stuff. You see people talking about going to certain businesses in their community and you know different people treating them 
diff in different ways. Uh, there's always this, there's um, a book that was published years ago. It's called Koreans in the Hood. And they talk about so that, that conflict in terms of, you know, Koreans open stores in black communities and that conflict that happens there. Um, so it can happen in the local areas, but that can happen other places too. There are these dynamics that a lot of times are unspoken, right? We don't talk about them, and researchers public books on them that sometimes nobody reads. So I mean, you don't really know the dynamics, but some of these things do exist out there. Uh, so it's not just uh, you know something that's in the local community. It's also you go out to other places as well, and it's not all the time. But I'm just saying, it's it, it can happen. And, in any of those places. Sure, what's up? Um, they were saying that once you, oh, oh, they were saying once you get caught uh, in that store for shoplifting, you, even, even if you've been profiled or whatever, they still find you. How are they able, were they able to get away with finding you if they already apprehended you and got their, their product back from the shoplifter. It's, it's, it's an it's a interesting policy. I, I, I should know more about it, but it's just a process that's been going on for a while now where it is a, it's written into, it, it depends on the state you're in. Like in, in New York State, they're allowed. It's just called civil recovery. It's somehow, um, and I don't know if it's because because of the process of the goods being taken and the inconvenience, I don't know if that's what it's about, but it's pretty common in certain places. Uh, but it's gotten retailers in trouble more recently about so it. So someone is so you're going into a store, you're accused of shoplifting, you're given, a, you're saying someone gives you a fine. How how were they able to collect that fine? In some cases, the biggest controversy about it was that if you had a, a credit card for that retailer, they would actually charge it to that credit card. <laughs> yes, that was like a big deal, okay? Uh, but yeah, very, again, another topic very few people talk about. I looked in the literature and there's only like one or two articles that talk about civil recovery because again, we're talking about other type of things in criminal justice. We're talking about general fines, right? We do, you know, criminal justice, criminologists talk about fines and how that, you know, penalizes people that don't have money. They, but they're not talking about civil recovery, right? So it's just another thing kind of to introduce you to so you can go out there and kind of look at it and, and understand it. These things are out there, you know. Other questions? Anyone else, anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask? Let me just check online. No, um, OK, um, I think there is a question here. Let okay. me just check. Are you interested in studying the long-term effects of consumer profiling? I am constantly profiled, and I just don't go shopping in stores anymore. I am even afraid to go to the grocery store. The effects are soul-crushing for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I would like to study the long-term effects, but I have to get sort of funds to kind of consistently. I do study, I have studied it for 20 plus years, but what I've done has been kind of inconsistent. I just got funding to do the Canada study. I'm trying to find money to do a study in the UK. But I think really what needs to happen is just like with policing. In policing, we do annual, maybe every other year, I think it is, we do studies of um, traffic stops. There's like a big victimization survey that the Department of Justice does to find out you know, have you been, you know, stopped? What was the encounter like? All of this kind of stuff. So what they're doing is they're tracking the trends over time now. Because, you know, back in the 90s and, you know, 80s, where we really started studying profiling, people were like, okay, this is where we need to go. The Department of Justice picked it up and they do this. Um, it's called like a contact survey. So it's basically contacts you have with the police. And they, it's like a random survey of, of um, citizens in the United States to see what their experiences are. It's the same thing with this. Like, we need to kind of see, like, is it getting better? Or is it, you know, staying the same? Is it getting worse? Um, I think that's the importance of kind of tracking it over time. Uh, not just for consumers, yeah. but also for employees as well? Well, yeah. Um, the, the question is about whether the employees are also being profiled. Uh, the people who work there, are, are there, they're being, you know, uh, racial ethnic groups being looked at for employee theft more than other groups. My, it's a good question, but it's hard to get access to any data, right? So 
Um, I just say, at some point, somebody needs to do something. Maybe it'll be me. You'll do a Freedom of Information to get some of those records. But the problem is, the Freedom of Information Act is for what? Government, right? So it's very hard to get access to these records. Well, I was saying that um, wouldn't that also mean that the employer, you know, the um, the guy that was um, doing the sale or whatever was was also complicit to, you know, the shoplifting? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, saying? sometimes so, you have that going on. Yes, sometimes you, you do have that happening. But I think more of what we're... I think needs to happen is we need to get access to records to show. I mean, employee theft is one of the biggest, uh, another one of the big things that relate to losses to retailers. We need to see like what kinds of methods are they using? Who are they targeting? How do they figure out? You know, those type of things. So I think that's that's probably what we're lacking. Uh, years ago, I published an article um, on a case involving an employee. It was just one, just a case study. Is one case where they were in a store called um, Caldor, was it Caldor? I guess that was the name of the store. But they talked about, like, it gave me insights into like, you know, and I worked in the field, but I was trying to figure out the process of how they actually investigated this particular case and the things that they did, you know, I was like, so I was like, this, can, this may not be just an isolated incident, but how can I research it more than just getting a case that was in sort of the case cases out there on this particular topic? That's the, that's the only way, because the retailers are not giving. I told you, they don't want post shoplifting arrest, so they're definitely not going to post anything related to employee theft. But um, I think that's one of the things. And another thing years ago, I was involved with some, some people contacted me, and they wanted to get, um, they wanted to uh, talk about what we used to call stores mutual association hits. I don't know what it's called today, but. What they have is they have this service that all of the retailers um, uh, subscribe to. So if you go in there and you've been, a, let's just say you were you know, caught s stealing at a particular retailer and you wanted to get, you know, you made a mistake, you, you stole, you wanted to get a job at another retailer, they had this thing where it would be what we, when I was there, we call it an SMA hit. The person would come in and they would, it would come up that they actually were, um, you know, involved in theft or stole from another store. You know, and essentially, it just eliminated them from working in any retail establishment ever because it was this huge network. And we were just saying, you know, maybe there, there's another way to do this where we don't basically, you know, scar these people for the rest of their lives. You know, it was just like, so they were trying to, they were talking about doing some kind of suit or something like that and trying to push this thing because in some ways, you know, you, you, in many cases, you'll fire them, but you don't prosecute them. But you persecute them by basically saying, OK, you can never go to another retailer to work. You know? And I understand, to some extent, why they do that. Like, OK, this person stole. So you expect them to be a thief for their whole lives. And studies will show you that most people in the United States have stole something in their lives. They just don't have an SMA hit anywhere. They can go work somewhere, right? So I think you know, it's, it was an interesting case. It broke down at some point, so we, we didn't go through with it. But, it's kind of you know one of those things. Right now we're talking about ban the box, right? Like you know people commit an offense, let's um, you know give them a chance. But by having that box, we don't give them that chance um, in terms of you know have you ever been convicted of a crime, or whatever. You know so, so so there's a lot of things out there that I think would kind of improve what we do in terms of retailing and how we deal with these type of things, theft and all those things. But you know it's it's really hard to change retailers. Uh, because they're kind of operating in their own entity, you know. Um, so uh, I'll take other questions. That's fine. Yes. Hmm? Okay. Uh, my question is: Is there any current studies? Sorry. Is there any current studies that focus on racial profiling and COVID? Um, no, not that I know of. Um, so during COVID, I mean, we weren't really shopping that much, but yes, we, people were out there. No, I don't. I haven't seen anything related to specifically the shoplifting and COVID. So I, I should just say no. Right? I don't. I, I don't know of any. Okay. I have one question about the methodology. Okay. How do you measure uh, your major term profiling in shopping? Um, how do I measure it in terms of? Um, 
Wh which study? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you studied, uh, you keep mentioning the providing uh, for, for shopping. So provider uh, will be based on my understanding will be the retailer employee or uh, the security yeah. officer. But uh, yeah. how do you make sure the people feel being provider? Well, we gave them a definition of it, and if they felt their experience met the definition, then we considered that they had been profiled. So they have, we gave them the definition, and then... Yes, this is what I, I would like to know more detail. How do you define it? Um, okay, um, I don't have my definition, but, uh, but, but um, I guess I... Can I go back on this? I can... Uh, oh, you fresh... Um, going back, it's not doing it. I don't know. Is it stuck or something? Am I missing something? Yeah, I mean, it's we gave them a long definition, but basically, um, it's the notion that you feel like you've been in a situation where somebody is following you based upon your race, um, and they're following you because they believe that you know they, you feel like you. It's because of suspicion why they're following. You. And I have a long definition. I don't. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't remember all these definitions right now, but that's what I'm saying. It's probably stuck. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did put the slide on it. I had the definition. I didn't read the whole definition. Um, it's at the top. Uh, because that's what you have to do. You can't, you have to make sure you're operating from, everybody who takes the survey is operating from the same definition, right? So we, I had to come up with something that, um, that uh, was kind of universal in a sense. Uh, so here's the script. So the final question you asked you about consumer racial profiling, which we will refer to as CRP. CRP is defined as the act of discriminating against customers by retailers based on their race or ethnicity. This study is specifically concerned with CRP as it relates to your experience as a shopper being racially profiled by store clerks, managers, and security personnel. Okay. So that's kind of, it's a long definition, but you have to have something for them to kind of think about. Oh, everybody will be thinking of a different situation and saying they were profiled. So you gave them some benchmark, right? And that's what you have, I mean, that's what you This is what I really confuse. Uh, okay. So because it's a very subjective, someone walk in the store and so different feel differently. Do you agree? That's right. Yeah, 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 it is. I mean, but. That's inherently a weakness of perceptual studies, right? Because it's the perception of what happened. It doesn't necessarily mean it actually happened, but sometimes, right? But sometimes the issue is, especially with racial ethnic minorities sometimes when they go into particular uh, settings, the perception is, uh, it can impact them even if it's not real to some extent, because they've encountered it elsewhere, they may feel that it's the same thing going on. And it may not be profiled. It may be just that it's something else. But because it's such a consistent treatment, you know, you, you kind of react to it that way. So we don't know. I mean, but we gave them something at least as a baseline. Because you're right. If we just said, have you experienced racial profiling in retail studies? And they say yes. Respondent one may be saying yes about something totally different than respondent two, respondent three, respondent four. So this is, you know, the best we could do. But yes, I just, you know, measurement is always like a big issue with these type of things. Even when we did the experimental study, how we measured it was the perception of the person who we sent in, the test that we sent in. We didn't measure it by the perception of somebody actually looking at the security person and our tester and saying, whoa, that security person is following that person more closely than that person. I mean, you have to have a tremendous amount of money to do that. <laughs> you know, so you can only do it and say these are the weaknesses of it. So this go to your experiment. I think it's a better way to measure uh, at least uh, your tester. I think that before you go to your experiment, they receive certain training yes. and they give the pr consistent definition so the yes. result will be more reliable. Yes. By the same token, uh, you mentioned the funding seems to know any significant factor except the uh, Asian feel something and the white male feel something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's, you know, it, it, the reason why I talk about the study is to show that, you know, 
there's another way to do this, a better way to do this, and hopefully, one day I walk into, you know, I walk out of the presentation. Somebody say, you know what? I work for this foundation. We would really like to fund you to do a big study, you know. So, but until then, you kind of have to, just like any research, you do the best you can with what you have, you know. And that's what we tried to do. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Great, Chris. All right, one. I think we have one last question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does racial prof profiling only specifically go f with shoplifting? Could it also be that the retailer doesn't believe that you have enough money to buy any of their products and they go and try to prevent window shopping in some cases? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, to some extent, yeah. I mean, as I said, I mean, there's two types of this, right? I'm looking at suspicion, but uh, sometimes those two things collide, right? So. I, because I'm a criminologist, I almost want to separate the other stuff, but you can't, right? I'll give you an example. One of the things that I found too in some of my research is that some of the cases that I found are um, minority customers go in to make a purchase and they use their credit cards. And there's all kinds of um, hurdles they have to go through because they, you know, there's the perception that you know, something's going to be wrong with that credit card, you know, the, and, if, and if they make a large purchase with the credit card, they're checking to see if the credit card was stolen. I mean, some of the cases you see are just like, you know, why is that? But that's the collision of, of that first part, the service, like you're immediately believing that this person, you know, is up to something in terms of, you know, they can't afford the goods, right? And then it crosses over to, not only do I not think they can afford the goods, but they might have probably stolen that card that they're going to use to try and buy them. I mean, there's a, so there is that collision of the two. It's just that there's a lot more research on the other side of that. Um, you know, and I think you know, I'm trying to build research on, on this side of it so that people will get more interested in it. Hoping my students at Sam Houston will be interested in it. So they'll just carry on and do you know, some of their own research in the area. That's, that's really the goal, not for me to do all the research in this area, right? So, but, but yeah. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, then. Um, Dr. Gavadon, thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. I pre really appreciate uh, it. Round of yeah, applause you. there. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. very much. Yeah. And if you would, ladies and gentlemen, please, those of you who are online as well as yeah. those of you who are here, uh, okay. please take our survey. Very important uh, for us. It just takes about 30 seconds. If you could do that, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you online.